John's Gospel, chapter 1. We come as far as um, verse 14. If you recall, John, remember, probably wrote this, this Gospel late after A.D. 70, after the destruction of the temple, though we're not 100% sure on that. And if you remember, he brings us back to the beginning, not only the beginning of time, he brings us back before time. And he tells us about Jesus, and he tells us that he always was, he always will be, but, and he describes him to us as the Word of God. So God, wanting to make himself known to the human race, yes, as, as the Creator, and it says in, in John chapter 1, Verse 3, that everything was made by Jesus and nothing was made that was made except he made it. He did it all. And God wanted to be close to the human race, wanted to be intimate with the human race, stepped into time, from eternity stepped into time. And and that's kind of where we left off. He He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. All that God is, so we can understand him a little bit so we can comprehend a little bit so we can see his love his grace and and the way he is and the way he reacts and the things he thinks of and the way he deals with people and the way he glorifies his father jesus we see as jesus steps into time and 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 john describes it to us that way he says the word all that god is became flesh and he dwelt among us And then it says this, look in the middle of verse 14, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He says the the biggest thing we saw out of Jesus' things was grace and truth. That God is gracious. And he's going to tell us in a couple verses, grace upon grace. God is so gracious, and not only is he he gracious, he's full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. And that, isn't that the way God works in our lives? Yes, we fall and we mess up and we sin and God gives us grace, but he always wants us to walk in truth. It's never just live the way you want and do what you want and you can do whatever you want because you have Jesus and you have grace. No, it's grace and it's truth. We're given grace and truth. And that's what they saw out of Jesus. He never compromised God's truth. He was the walking word of God, but he was full of grace and compassion and love towards people. He says, that's what we saw out of him. This God, this word became a man, became flesh, and he walked among us. Literally, he tabernacled among us. He walked around among us. And we touched him, we saw him, we handled him. We saw the way he loved people and dealt with people. We saw when he stood upon the truth. We saw what he did with the Pharisees and the way he had to correct them because he was truth. And we also saw when people were caught up in sin and broken and needy the way he dealt with them in grace. And he was full of that. Verse 15. Now he's going to move in here to John the Baptist, giving us witness and giving the people of that day witness of the Lord Jesus walking among them and what he was going to do. Verse 15. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So John already is saying that the one who's coming was pre-existent. God is coming to the world. Listen, don't let anybody tell you that the Bible doesn't say that Jesus is God. No, there's not a verse that says Jesus is God. That's not that kind of a verse that says that. But it says everywhere that the word was God in verse 1, chapter 1. It says everywhere that in verse 3, God made everything and Jesus made everything. So Jesus is God. And and, and then John says, he was before me. He was preferred before me. He's preexistent and now he's coming into the world. And he's going to talk about John the Baptist and and his ministry. Now remember the one that wrote this, John the Apostle, not John the Baptist, obviously. He was the youngest 
of the apostles, probably 15, 16, when he started to walk with Jesus. But he's there from the beginning. He was around during John the Baptist's ministry. He was actually a disciple of John the Baptist. And he heard John the Baptist preach. He watched him preach. He was with him. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene, this kind of strange character. The Bible says he ate locusts and wild honey, and he was, you know, preached at you know, the Jordan. And, he, and his whole ministry was to point to Jesus Christ, to proclaim that Jesus Christ was coming into the world, the Messiah. But it's interesting, as you read through this, John the Baptist didn't know that Jesus, his own cousin, was the Messiah until the baptism. He didn't know that. Even when he was a baby in his mother's womb, when Mary came um, near his mother, John was in his mother's womb, it says that John jumped for joy in his, in his mother's womb. But he fully didn't know that Jesus was the Christ until this baptism, and it's very interesting. He says this, And of his fullness, verse 16, have all we received in grace for grace. He goes, what we received of his fullness, and when it's saying fullness here, it means never runs out. He's full of grace all the time, and that grace never, ever, ever runs out. And he says, we received what? Grace for grace. Grace for grace. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Now listen to me. Grace is more than, grace does more for us than forgive us of our sins, though that's what it does. All right? God gives us grace and we're forgiven of our sins when we believe in Jesus Christ. But grace empowers us. The things you get to do in this life and the gifts that God has given to you, the natural talents and the spiritual abilities that God has given to you, that's because of his grace. You didn't earn that. He gave that to you. You can't boast about it. Your natural abilities and your spiritual gifts, that's because of his grace. If you have a spouse, it's because of his grace. If you have children, it's because of his grace. If you have a home, it's because of his grace. If you have food to eat, it's because of his grace. God doesn't owe anybody anything. And he's saying the fullness of his grace, it continues to flow grace upon grace upon grace. And listen, especially to the believer, but not only the believer, to the unbeliever too. Jesus said the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Because God is good. He's good. And he goes, of this fullness, we've received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And his grace never stops flowing. And it never will stop flowing. He makes a contrast here in verse 17 about Christ. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now listen, we know the law was given by Moses. You know the Ten Commandments and all the the other laws. There's over 600 of them in the Old Testament. And we know that's God's word. Given to Moses and to the Jews. They had the oracles of God. And yes, it was God's word. But remember, with the law, remember God's holy standards, right? Right? And again, God doesn't compromise them. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Now listen to me. God's holy standards, God's law. Remember what else was given with the law? Remember? A sacrificial system. Right? God gave the law to the children of Israel. His holy standards. And listen, it was for them personally, but it was also for them civilly. So they can know how to live with one another. So they would know how to treat one another. So they would know how to live and tolerate one another. And how they were supposed to react or not react toward a holy God. And that law was given by Moses, God's holy word. But with that was given a sacrificial system. Read the book of Leviticus. Over and over again, there's this offering, and then there's the next offering, and then there's another offering, and then there's another offering, and there's another offering. Why? Because God's law and His holiness never changes, but God knows that we need grace and able to attain that, to be able to attain that, because we can't attain. So grace was given, listen, and all the pictures of grace, that's what the sacrificial system was all about, that you can't keep God's holy law. 
But God's not going to compromise that law. God's not going to dumb it down. God's not going to just wink at sin and just say it's okay. His law, his standards, he's holy. They will never change. And with the law, he gives a sacrificial system that does what? Points to the grace of Jesus Christ. All through the Old Testament, you see that. Now listen. This law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Now listen. I met with a a couple this week, and you know, know, a new believer, and you know, the questions go like, you know, how's God like, you know, three in one? Right? You, you know, some of you have gone through that before. Well, God's the Father, and then He's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. How's that all work out? And I say, I don't know. I don't know. One plus one plus one is three, but one times one times one is one. That's as much as my feeble mind can figure out. Okay? <laughs> and again, you, you, listen, you hear me say this all the time. Every cult starts with the misconception of the Godhead. Don't try to figure Him out. Don't try to do it. Now listen to me. The Bible says the Father's God, the Son's God, and the Holy Spirit's God, but there's one God. That's, that's what it says. All the way back, Deuteronomy 6, 4, when God calls His people out, God gives them the holy law. Moses calls, to, calls out all the people and he starts to preach to them and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And there's plurality in that statement. He's one God. But this, he's plural. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, in this verse right here, he says this, no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen him. But it says, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Now, what does that mean? He's shown him. He's made him manifest. He's made God manifest. When the word became flesh, he's showing people what God is like. Remember, show us the Father and it sufficeth us, old King James. And we'll, we'll understand. We'll get it, Philip says. And Jesus says, have I been so long with you? You don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he says, remember about the Holy Spirit, he goes, I have to go away. I have to go away. If I don't go away, I, I, you know, I can't send another comforter to you. And then Jesus says in that statement, he goes, don't worry. And they're worrying, where are you going? Where are you going? We want to know the way. Jesus says, we, you know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And, and then after that, they're going down and they're wondering, well, wait a minute. Where are you going? We followed you all this time. You can't go anywhere. And then he goes, listen, I have to go away, but I will come to you. In the person of the Holy Ghost. Now, I can't figure that out. There's things in the scriptures here that I I just, right here, you know what it says? It says, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. You know what that means? That means while Jesus was walking around on earth as a man, he was in the bosom of the Father. Can you figure that out? I can't. When Jesus was walking around on earth and he would pray and he would look up to his father, he was somehow spiritually in the bosom of his father. It says isn't. It It doesn't say he was in the bosom of the father. He was presently in the bosom of the father. I can't figure that out. I don't get it. If you read through chapter 1 at the chapter 2, Jesus says the son of man is in heaven right now when he was walking around. I don't get that. But listen, that's what makes the Word of God the Word of God. It's deep. It's so simple that a child can understand the Gospel, but it's so deep that you cannot figure out God and His majesty. His ways are so much higher than our ways. His thoughts so much higher than our thoughts. But John, remember, John has a vocabulary of about 600 words. All right? That's about what I have. I told you that last week. 600 words. All right? Usually a, a, a child around seven, eight years old has a, a, a vocabulary of about 600 words. But with that being said, with that limited vocabulary, he's able to take the deepest things of God and try to 
explain them to us. To try to make it clear so we can somewhat, a little bit, be able to comprehend the majesty of what we're dealing with here with the Word of God. See, I don't know about you, that does something for me. When I pick up God's Word, I'm not just picking up a textbook. I'm not just picking up a history book. Though it is all those things, it's more than that. It's God's Holy Word. Jesus is the Word of God. When He spoke, He spoke the Word of God. And the Bible is alive. It's living. It is the Word of God. And He says, when He came into the world, He was full of grace and truth. Listen, and the scriptures teach us that he still walks among his people. He talks with his people. He communes with his people. Listen, when I walk with Jesus Christ, when I get along with Jesus Christ, right, and I, and I start to pour up my heart to Jesus Christ and I start to ask him, I'm asking him for wisdom. I'm like, Lord, you know, we need some help here. We need, we need some help. I can't do this church thing, this ministry thing without you. We got this building program going on. I'm like, well, what if we build this building? And what if nobody comes? And there's spiritual warfare going on here. And oh, Lord, look what's going on. What's going on in the church? People are hurting. There's division happening. People are getting hard-hearted. You know what that does for me? That, that, know what that helps me understand? That I wasn't made to control any of this. And neither are you. When things go on in your life and in your heart with your family, with your kids and all this, and you're trying to juggle life and you're trying to juggle a marriage and you're trying to juggle kids and juggle a job and you have mortgage payments and all this stuff and God lets all that happen so you might know that you weren't made to carry all those burdens alone. That you can't control it. It doesn't mean you're not supposed to work hard at it and give it your all, but you know what it should do? Drive you to your face and say, God, I need you. (laughs) you got to be in this or it's fruitless. Help me, Lord. Remember Paul, again, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I guess God wanted me to go here. All right. Remember Paul in 2 Corinthians 12? He said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. He says, therefore I take pleasure in persecutions and infirmities and reproaches. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now listen, if there was somebody that, somebody that walked around back then that was smarter than anybody, it was Paul. If there was somebody back then that could debate better than anybody and prove it textually, it was Paul. But Paul said, I need to understand one thing, that I need to take pleasure when I feel weak and when I feel beat up. I need to take pleasure in reproaches and infirmities and weaknesses because when I'm weak, I know that it's God's going to shine, that he can be strong. And, and when I read the word of God, I'm, I'm, I'm not just reading something that I can fully get to convey to people. I'm reading something that is higher than me that is holy, that I need to do my best to say, God, just use me as the instrument so people can see you and not me. Listen, when people come to church, that's my prayer. I want them to have an experience with the living God through His Word, through the teaching of His Word, through worship, through fellowship. People should say, hey, you know what? I met with God today a little bit more. I, I, not only did I learn something new, I experienced Him a little bit more in my life. That's what I want. And I say it to God, God, if that's not going to happen, then I'll do something else. He says, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Nobody has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Verse 19, and this is the record of John, John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? So John the Baptist is out there baptizing, okay? Okay. Uh, he's out there baptized, dunking them in the water. Bap- baptized means to immerse, okay? He's out there just putting people in water, putting them under the water, and bringing them back up. And then people are like, what's this guy doing? Who is he? Now, of course, the religious crowd, they got to get involved because remember, the Levites, every priest was a Levite, but every Levite wasn't a priest, okay? Now, stay with me. 
It was their job to, to know about the spiritual things of the day. But now there's a prophet on the scene. The priest had a very specific job to do. Everything was detailed for them in the script, in the Old Testament scriptures. How they would address sacrifices, where they were supposed to go, things they were supposed to do, how things were supposed to be cleaned and cleansed. And when it came to washings, baptisms and washings, remember the priests had to wash themselves in the laver and everything else, which was in the, in the, um, in the court outside the tabernacle. They're wondering, what's this guy doing these, these washings for, these baptisms? What's going on with that? So the priests and the Levites, they come down and they say, John, John, to John the Baptist, who are you? Who, who are you? Now, John was a prophet. To be a prophet, again, to me, was a little bit more difficult than being a priest, and I'll tell you why. Because listen, to be a prophet, you had to hear from God. You not only had to have the word of God and know the word of God, you had to hear from God. God, is this you speaking to me? Are you telling me something here? The priest's job was laid out for them to the T. This, 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 and this. This is what they had to do. So the priests come down to hear this prophet and they say, who are you? Who are you? What are you doing? Okay? That's what people say when they come in here. Who are you? I'm nobody. I'm nobody. You see the guy walking across the street with that that shirt? I got to stop wearing that shirt. You you could see all this in here. But uh, who are you? I don't know. What are you doing? I don't know. Do you know what you're doing up the street? I don't know. Thank God Jonah knows, but I don't know. Right? Do I know what I'm doing up here? No, I don't know. (laughs) I just pray and I just study the word and I just try to give it out as best I can. Hopefully in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they say, John, who are you? Who are you? And it was their job, the religious crowd, they were, they were supposed to understand these things. They were supposed to come inspect these things. Verse 20 says, And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Well, he tells them who he's not. Who are you? He goes, well, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not him. So right away, he, he gets it out of their minds that he's trying to pr- proclaim to be the deliverer of Israel. He's saying, I'm, I'm not the Christ. That's one person I'm not. And then they asked him after that, what then? Are you Elias or Elijah? Because remember, remember, it was prophesied in Malachi that before the Messiah came, there was going to be a forerunner, okay? And Elijah was going to come back and declare the way of God, that the Messiah was on the scene. But he tells them that, no, I'm not Elijah. I'm not him. Then they said, and he saith to them, I'm not him. And then they said, are you that prophet? And he answered, no. So first he says, I am not, I am not. And then he says, no. Now when they say that prophet, remember in Deuteronomy, God says through Moses, Moses prophesies to the people, Moses says to them, He goes, God will raise up a prophet like unto me. In the future, he's going to be the shepherd of Israel. He's going to be the one that everyone is supposed to follow after. But they ask, and and John says, I'm not him either. So who are you, John? So he's not the Christ. He's not Elijah. He's not that prophet. He's not, not any of that. And he admits that to them clearly. Verse 22, then they said unto him, then who are you? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of yourself? What are you saying of yourself? What are you doing out here doing these religious ceremonies in the name of God? We're supposed to be the priests and the teachers. We're supposed to be doing this stuff. Who are you? Who are you? If you're not the Christ, you're not that prophet, you're not Elijah, who are you? Can you please tell us? So we can go back and tell the other religious leaders that what you're doing here. He said... I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah or Isaiah. He says, I'm the one that was prophesied about in Isaiah. And I'm crying in the wilderness. Now, what does he mean when he says crying in the wilderness? Yes, was it desert? Listen, when the Bible says wilderness, it doesn't mean like, woods and trees and all that stuff that's how we see it the wilderness is like desert places 
When, when, when we say the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, literally they wandered in the desert places, okay? Now what he's really preaching to here is the human heart in the state of Israel. Hear me now. He's preaching to the state of Israel. He's saying, your hearts are like desert places, and they've been like that for 400 years, more than that. And he goes, I'm crying in the wilderness. I'm crying out in the name of God. I'm preaching and prophesying in the name of God, and I'm baptizing people in the name of God. Because Israel, sadly enough, was in a state of barrenness. They were dry. Listen, they were dry. Now stay with me here. They were dry. They were away from God. All the priests and the Levites were doing was going through their religious ceremonies and religious rituals, and God was doing something new. God's doing something new to get the people's attention. Now listen to me. We need God to do a new work in our lives all the time. We need God over and over again to give us a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. See, you know what? Because we get caught up in the everyday rigmarole of life. And even in ministry and even in church, we just get caught up in it. And we get barren. We get dry. And, and listen, I believe God's in heaven and what he does is he's orchestrating our lives. He's orchestrating things in our lives to get our attention so he can continually do a new work in our lives and draw us closer to Jesus, draw us closer to his side so he can fill us more and use us more. And he goes, I'm the one crying in the wilderness like Isaiah talked about. Make his path straight. Now remember, in the, in the Isaiah passage, it talks about hills and this and roads and everything's in the way, but what he's preaching to is the human heart. Make your heart right. The hilly areas, make them straight. The areas in your life and in your heart that are away from God, make it straight, make it clean, repent. Get your life right with God. That's what he's saying. That's what he's doing, and that's what we need to say to ourselves every day. Lord, the things in my life, the obstacles, the hills, the mountains that, that are in my heart and in my life that I know you can move, but that I don't want to move, Lord, you need to make them straight. And I'm willing to let you do that, God. Verse 24. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, why do you baptize? Or why baptizest thou then if you be not the Christ, nor Elijah or that prophet? He goes, why are you doing this ceremony out here? If you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not that prophet, why you, can you tell us why you're doing this? We asked who you are, and you're not any of these you know, three people, the Christ, the prophet, or Elijah. You're not him. You, all right, you're saying you're the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Oh, oh, okay, we understand our scriptures a little bit, but why are you baptizing? Why are you doing this? Now remember this. If you read the other gospel accounts, John starts to preach at these religious leaders. Remember what he says? I love the way John preached, by the way. He preached right at them. He called them right out. He goes, listen. He goes, scribes, Pharisees, you brood of vipers. He goes, don't think within yourselves that you're Abraham's seed, that you're God's people, that you're in God's line. So you're blessed and you're separated. Don't just think because you're from Abraham that you're okay in God's, in God's mind and in God's sight. Remember he starts to preach at them? And he goes, repent and bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. He goes, don't just say it because I'm of Abraham's seed that I'm okay with God. Listen, we do this all the time. People grow up in the church and they say, oh, I'm a this, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a that. Whatever. Don't, God doesn't care what you say you are. He cares about who you are. And if you have and love Jesus Christ. And he starts to preach to them and then they start to question him. And he goes, why are you baptizing then? Why are you doing this? John answered, verse 26 saying, I baptize with water. But there stands one among you, literally standeth, when you see the eth 
F in the King James, that's, again, I'm a King James guy, so not that you have to be, but it means present tense. I mean, you see that TH if you're reading the King James along with me. He goes, there's one that standeth right now. There's somebody here right now among us that's standing right now among us. Listen, he says, among you whom you know not. He goes, there's somebody standing right now here among us who you don't know. He it is who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. That was the job of the lowest servant or slave in the house to take off the shoes of those who came in. He goes, I'm not even worthy to do that to this one that is standing with us right now. And listen, we need to understand that. And I need to understand that everything we do is before the presence of God. Everything. That means when you leave this, pra- this place today and you go out here on 114 down to Route 1 and you flip out at somebody because of the way they're driving, it's in the presence of God. When you're behind closed doors and it's just you and your wife or you and your kids, you're in the presence of God. When we come together in church, you know, we know how to put on a show a little bit, but we're in the presence of God. Everything we do is before the watchful eye of God. Now, what John is telling them is there's one standing in this group of people, in this crowd of people. Listen, remember, thousands were coming out because they hear there's this prophet that's preaching and he's on the scene. What is going on here? Is God doing something? Is God really involved in this? He, is God doing something? It, it seems a little strange here because he's not of the priest. He's not, a, he's not a Levite. What is he? What is he doing? There's thousands there. John's preaching at the Pharisees and the scribes calling them vipers. And, and, and all this is going on, and he's baptizing people, and they're questioning him. And then he tells them, there's somebody standing among us right now that I'm not even worthy to unloose the latchet of his sandals. Look what he says, verse 28. These things were done in Bathbara beyond Jordan where John was baptized. Now listen, there's a little hint here. God's telling us something here. When it says Beth Barah beyond Jordan, what he's saying is this. It's the same place in the, listen, it's the same place in the book of Joshua where the children of Israel crossed over Jordan. That's where John is. And what what the Holy Spirit's telling us here is this. When they crossed over Jordan, right, God was doing a new thing, correct? He was taking that next generation into the promised land. From wandering in the wilderness, wilderness, the desert places, he's taking that next generation into the promised land. He's doing something new. So John's in that same spot baptizing. How do we know he's in the same spot? Remember I preached this on a couple weeks ago, the Memorial Day message about the stones. All right, the stones that were there. Again, in the other Gospels, when John is preaching, he goes, God is able from these stones... To raise up children unto Abraham. What stones? The same stones that were put on the bank of Jordan. That's how we, why we know that John was baptizing right there. And what he's showing them is just like God did a new thing, bringing the children of Israel into the promise. And he goes, God is doing something new right now. He's doing something spectacular. He's doing something special. Now listen. We want God to do this in our lives. I want God to do this in my life, in ministry. All these things. Now hear me. God operates on His timetable though. Okay? He operates on His timetable. We're supposed to pray, God, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Things need to be done Your way, God. And He's operating on His timetable. Now listen. You know, we pray for revival. We're praying for revival. We want revival in this area, in the country, in our land, in the world. Um, you know, and I, I, I met with my pastor of, uh, about a month ago. And as I met with him, he says, there's just something going on in the, in, in the country. There's so many pastors that are throwing in the towel, that are giving up, that are discouraged. They don't, want to, they don't want to do it anymore. It's getting hard. It's difficult. What's going on in our land? And you know what? He was telling me about what his pastor said to him. And this is what he said. He goes, God always allows that 
before he sends revival. Before he sends revival. There's going to be a state of desperation, wilderness, barrenness, and then God's going to move and he's going to send revival. Listen, I've never seen it in my life. I've heard about the, the movements in the 60s and 70s. I've heard about all those things. But I want to see God do it again. Now, God's doing it in other parts of the world where the shorelines are loaded with people and hundreds are getting baptized all at once. I want to see that again in our nation, in our country. And that's kind of what God's doing here with John the Baptist. Hundreds, thousands are coming and they're getting baptized by droves. By droves. And then the religious crowd is like, what is going on? This isn't the way we do things. Usually God will step outside of the way the religious crowd usually does things to do something different and to do something new. Verse 29. I'm almost done. It says, now the next day, the next day, one day after all this, preaching at the Pharisees, all this is going on, John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. He sees Jesus walking among them that was standing among them the day before. Now he sees him coming to him and he goes, There he is. That's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now again, that should have clicked in the people's minds. Because what was a lamb? The lamb was... Sacrifice, slaughter. And he goes, he's right there. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now listen, John still, listen, John still doesn't fully get this. Because remember, some time goes by, Jesus' ministry starts to increase, John's ministry starts to decrease. Remember what happens with John? He's grabbed by Herod, he's thrown in jail, all that happens, right? And John's discouraged. John's wondering what's going on. And then John grabs his disciples while he's in jail. He has a consultation with them. He goes, go and ask Jesus, my cousin, go and ask him if he's the one that should come or should we wait for another? Remember that story? He's discouraged. He's wondering. Now he just says, behold the lamb, lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, right? He doesn't fully get what Jesus is coming to do to be the sacrifice for, for, for sins. Even though he prophesies and says he's the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. Remember? And then John sends his disciples to Jesus, and then they go and ask Jesus. Well, John sent us, and they said, are you the one that should come, or should we look for another? Because John's in jail. He's wondering what's going on. He's about to be beheaded. Everything else is going on. What's up with this? Remember what Jesus said? You go tell John. Tell John. The blind see. Right? The lame are brought back to health. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And then he says, blessed are those who don't doubt me. Imagine John hearing that. He goes, you're blessed if you don't doubt me. See, because we go through some of that same stuff. Lord, but I have you in my life. I've been serving you. I've been doing a work for you, whatever it is. I've been trying to live for you, Lord. And I'm wondering why all this is going on. Why, how come this is happening to me? This is painful. This is hard. This is difficult. Everything else. And then what? You know what Jesus says? You're blessed. Don't doubt me. Don't forget the works I've done in your life. That you were blind. Now you can see. Now you were lame. Now you're on your way to heaven. You know, but I've done this work in your life. John says, amongst the crowd, Jesus comes up. He says, behold, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sin of the world. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man, which is referred before me, for he was before me, talking about again the preexistence of Christ, and I didn't know him. He goes, I knew him not. I didn't know my cousin was the Messiah. I didn't know my cousin was the Lamb of God. He goes, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. He goes, God wanted to reveal himself. And God kind of spoke to me and he told me to go do this baptism ceremony. Now listen, how did he know that? Verse 33, verse 32. 
And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. He says, as my cousin Jesus, who was there the day before, and I'm doing all these baptisms, he goes, God revealed to me that the Messiah was there. I didn't know it was Jesus. But I, but I knew he was standing among us. I knew he was there, but I didn't know who it was exactly. And all of a sudden, he's coming out, and I see the Spirit of God. How you see a Spirit, I don't know. I, I can't figure it out. But he sees the Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. And it, as it starts to descend on Jesus, right, it rests over him. And it descends on him. It's weird. And, and it's like, how did John know this was going to happen? Well, look at it. Verse 33. And I knew him not. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to be him. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Somehow, some way. John's communing with God, and God tells him some things. God, tell, God shares with him some things. God shares, and he says, John, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be out there baptizing, and you're going to see the Spirit descend on somebody. That's how you know who the Son of God is, who the Christ is, who the Lamb of God is. So he's communing with God, and God tells him, now he's got to walk by faith. He's going to go, God, am I really hearing from you? Really, God? Is that really you? You ever go through that? You ever go through that? You're at the Dunkin' Donuts counter and God says, hey, give that person a track. What? Everybody's looking at me, right? Am I really hearing from you? And this is what I say to people. Only God's going to tell you to do that. <laughs> really. Seriously. It's not going to be the devil saying, hey, give that person a track. I'll invite someone to church. Right? Only God's going to do that. But I go through this stuff. I'm like, God, is this really you? Is this really you? And then I, then I weigh it out in my mind. Well, it's something good and holy and biblical. It's got to be from you, God. Mm, I really don't want to do it, though, but I'll do it. So John's got to walk by faith. He thinks he's hearing from God. He's saying, okay, God, you're speaking to me. I'm going to go out. I'm going to just get in this river, and I'm going to call people to baptize. You told me that people want to come. And then you also told me that the, the Messiah is going to come, and I don't know who he is, but you told me, that the spirit somehow, I don't know what a spirit looks like, is going to descend on him like a dove. I know what a dove looks like. Somehow John gets to see into the spiritual realm some way. God told him that he was going to do this. Listen. We have the word of God, but we also have the spirit of God. God will speak to us. It'll never be outside of his word. The Holy Spirit will only confirm in us what his word already says. But God's going to brood us along like that. God's going to move us along like that. And it's up to us to listen to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. It's up to us to go through that stuff. God, is that really you? Are you speaking to me? I mean, are you, is this, okay, Lord, I, I'll, I'll start to go that way. I'll go home and have a conversation with my wife. She's going to tell me I'm crazy, but, you know, whatever. God's going to move in you like that. God's going to do those things. Listen, the Bible says your sons and your daughters will prophesy, right? Yes, it's not only foretelling the word of God, it's foretelling also that God wants to do something in our lives. It says your old men, old women will dream dreams and have visions. It says that. And they're never going to be outside of the word of God. They're going to be within the context of the word of God, but God can do those things. And John's sitting there and he says, okay, Jesus is coming. And he thinks it's, hey, what's up, cousin Jesus? And then he's like, that's the Lamb of God. That takes away the sin of the world. And the Spirit's descending on him like a dove. He goes, I saw this. and I Now John saw this also, the apostle, because he's there. And he says, I saw and bear witness of this, that this is the Son of God. Listen, that's what we're supposed to be doing for Jesus, bearing witness that he is the Son of God, that he did take away the sins of the world. And God will empower that message. Now listen, I'll close with this. You might have heard me said this before, and it's, God makes it very simple here. 
Remember what the dove was? The dove was the symbol of sacrifice and the symbol of poverty. Okay? And when the Spirit of God descends on Jesus like a dove and rests on Him, God the Father, what God the Father is doing, He's confirming from heaven that this is the sacrifice. Now listen, you see the Godhead all in one right here. The Son of God comes. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit descends on Him. And remember, I don't know if it's Matthew or Luke tells us, then the Father speaks from heaven and He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Because the Father's confirming the sacrifice. He's saying, this is my sacrifice. He is perfect. And I am well pleased with Him. And He's going to pay for all of you just like He paid for all of us. That's the message we need to be given out.